I love this. Nobody wants to sit down. Everybody just wants to keep talking. I love it. This is family, y'all. Come on. It's a big family reunion. I like it. <laughs> this is great. All right, man. How many of y'all are excited for Sunday morning? Y'all, it's August 4th. Is that not wild? <laughs> We're going to have a good day in church today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to give you a few different scripture passages. Uh, but if you have a paper Bible or on your phone, I, go ahead and bookmark for me. If you can, go ahead and bookmark Luke chapter 11. We're going to go there here in a few minutes. It's not the text I'm preaching from, but it's probably the most important text in my message. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to learn a lot from that particular text. You can also, Matthew chapter 6 will give you some of the same stuff. We're going to talk about all that. Um, but today I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to celebrate a couple things with you, and then I've got a very strategic message to kick off this series that we're starting today called Power Moves. How many of y'all want a power move in your life? Like I want a power move from God in my life, and uh, I've been following Jesus now with everything that I have for 11 years, and uh, my goal is always to receive a little more of His power and presence in my life than I had the season before. We do two seasons of 21 days of prayer and fasting as a church every year, every January and every August. Now, I came from uh, a culture where we did this every January, and early on, I didn't really participate. I'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna fast. I'm fasting vegetables, you know, or whatever. I pick something crazy, like, I'm, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast this, that. I'm gonna fast some television, you know, or whatever. But as time went on and I started to mature in my faith, I learned why I wanted to fast, not why people tell me I should fast, but like why I wanted to fast. And so today I'm going to try to help you with some of that. I'm going to give you some resources here in just a moment. But before we move forward, last week we saw two more people in this room say yes to Jesus. Praise God for that. That's huge. And so now today we've seen 170 people give their lives to Jesus in one of our services. That's powerful. I love that. And as we inch toward our third anniversary, it's amazing how I look back and talking to one of our team members recently. And he said, man, I was a part of a church for years before I found Trove Heights. And he said, I, I don't think we had, you know, 10 in a whole year. I'm like, for real? Sometimes we can overlook what God's doing because we, we want so much more. And while, while I do believe we should ask God for more and believe for more, I want to thank God for what he's done. Come on, let's thank him for what he's doing in his, in his house, in our church. I love it. I love it. So many of you are new around here. And uh, honestly, 2024 has been a game changer of a year for our young church. I'm not going to get into all the details because then I'll, I won't be able to celebrate it with you on the anniversary in a few weeks. But I just want to encourage you now, invite people to the anniversary on the 25th. Um, I, I'm believing in the season ahead that we're going to run out of room in this place. I'm just believing that. I pray for you every morning. I, every morning, God, I pray for the people of Trove Heights that you help them experience your presence in a new and a rich way. I pray you build them. I pray you grow them and in turn build this church. I pray for you every morning. I, just, you're, I wake up thinking about you and I wake up sh making sure that I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus and interceding on your behalf as we dig into a series called Power Moves. Really the reason we need more power is because without the power and presence of God, we have nothing as a church. We, we don't want to impress people. Well, I don't want to give you a word on a Sunday that just tickles the ears, so to speak, or just the good stuff. Y'all know, if you've been around here for any amount of time, you hear me pray. I preach in this world, you're going to have some trouble. Ha! Come on. <laughs> Jesus said, but, but I've overcome the world. We're going to preach the truth of the word of God and watch God do some powerful things. And as we dig into 21 days of prayer and fasting, I just want to encourage you to dig in with us. You can bookmark this. You'll see it on the screen. Troveheights.com slash 21 days. That, that link right there will take you. We have all kinds of resources on the website if you go to that link. Uh, we have a series of four or five different types of fasts that you can choose from, and it explains to you what each of those types of fasts are. But there's also a downloadable prayer guide. If you click the link, it'll send you to our PDF prayer guide. It's about 70 pages long. It's very in-depth. But the purpose of that is to give you a tool to help you pray. I think a lot of people don't really pray because they just don't know how to. And so in this prayer guide, we have different types of prayers, models of prayers. We're going to talk about some of that today. But take these resources, the fast, go look at the fast, figure out what, what does that look like for me. How many of y'all could fast some sugar in your life? Anybody? I could always fast more sugar in my life. Um, they, they keep telling me I need to fast coffee, but I'm like, the Lord, ain't, he ain't called me there yet, I don't think. I'm not sure about that one, but, but my, well, he's working on me. Maybe he'll, he'll get me there one day. But you can go find those types of fast. Now here at at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what type of fast you do. It just matters why you do what you're doing. Because fasting, this is what fasting is. Fasting is hungering for God. That's it. It is denying the flesh, something that the flesh wants, so that I can turn my ear and my attention towards God because I want more of God in my life. And I have found over the last 11 years 
Every time I fast, y'all, I'm telling you God does something new. Every time, never fails. Sometimes it's an answer to prayer of a big miracle blessing that I'm praying for. I've had some big miracles happen in a 21 days of prayer and fasting season. Then other times I'm praying for miracles and God does not give me any miracle that I was asking for. He gave me the miracle of pruning selfishness out of me or putting holiness in me, right? Like God, we all need that. So fasting will take you closer to God and it will help you control the flesh and make sure the spirit man is in the lead, okay? So go check out those resources. Also, uh, one other link, uh, the church that Megan and I came from, we were trained in ministry. Our lives were changed at this church in Birmingham, Alabama called Church of the Highlands. At this church, every weekday, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m., they have a one-hour prayer service. So we have the link that we can throw on the screen for you. Bookmark this link. If you'd like to participate, it's live at 6 a.m., but then they have it up for 24 hours on demand. And it'll be, if you go watch one, this is what you'll get in the room with us at 9 a.m. on Saturday mornings. We just aren't able to do these on our own during the weekdays because this is not our building. But hey, God's gonna give us a building one day soon in Jesus' name, okay? We're believing for that. In the meantime, we're gonna take our Saturdays and have a great time, and then we're gonna dive in. Megan and I will be in our living room turning that TV on, ready to go at 6 a.m. so that we can join in. And really, that's what this season of 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting is all about. God, I'm gonna turn my full attention to you. I'm gonna give you my first. I'm gonna give you all because I'm hungry for you. Anybody hungry for God in your life? I need more. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, the, the reason we want to have prayer as the really the forefront of our church, prayer is our first response, not our last resort. Everything that we do in this house is built on prayer. Um, we moved here and then we had 15 months of building a launch team before we launched the church. And every month leading up into our church, some of you were on the launch team. Gene was on the launch team. Some of you, Thane, we got a bunch of people who were on the launch team originally. And we set aside the first three days of every month leading up to launch to pray and fast for you. And we didn't even know you yet. We were just praying, God, build your house. And God, we want, we want all of what you want to do. And it's cool to see what God has done since. It is a practice in our lives. And honestly, if you want to mature in your relationship with God and grow in your relationship with God, this, the purpose of this is not to just do 21 days and check the box and God did 21 days. The purpose of this is so that you will grow into maturity in your relationship with God and then begin to insert it in your life as a discipline. I found over time, because of these corporate seasons of prayer and fasting, I have found that there are times where God personally calls me to fast. Sometimes I realize I need to fast and I've done this with Megan. I'll be like, man, I'm just frustrated recently and I don't know why. I'm gonna go fast this thing out and figure out what's going on. And I've had times where she'll be like, well, how long are you gonna fast? I'm like, I don't know. We're gonna see. And then day eight, I just felt it break. You know, fasting takes you closer to God and it removes the flesh, okay? That's the purpose. Does that help anybody? I hope that helps you, okay? Utilize these resources. And here's the reason why. How many of you have an iPhone? All the saved people. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's funny because all the people who don't have iPhones, they're like, I would never have an iPhone. Never. If you have a phone, how many of you charge your phone every night when you go to bed? Every night, like that's your practice. How many of you don't charge it when you go to bed? How many of you just charge it on the fly? Like, oh, it's about a dime. I'll charge it. How many of y'all? Oh, we're clapping for that. That's living by faith, ain't it? Okay. Uh, throw, throw this on the screen right here. This is, uh, this is what too many, if your phone looks like this, throw that first graphic up, Jonathan. How many of your phone looks like this right now? Come on, be real. Don't lie in church. All right. I feel you, Aaron. I love you, bro. The Cove. Let's go. I feel you. All right. Is this not a hard feeling, especially when you don't have, you ever like, oh, I don't have a charger. Oh my God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I don't have a charger. How am I, how am I going to make it? You ever have your phone die and you're like, Lord God, why have you forsaken me? What am I going to do today? You know, you don't know what to do. Too, too many of us are living like this in our Christianity. We, 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 don't, we don't charge. We don't charge our spirit. So we just wake up every day. We're like, I got a little juice I can flow on. How many of you would love if every time you looked at your phone, it looked like this next one? Oh, doesn't that feel, just something about that green, doesn't it? It just feels good, right? What would happen if all of us in our spiritual lives had this going on with our spirit? Now, here, here's the deal. Okay, we, we, have, these, we have these phones. Uh, at the end of the day, if you are not connected to the power source daily, this phone is good for nothing. Maybe you used it as a paperweight. Well, that's an expensive $1,200 pay for paperweight. Our oldest son, he's about to be 14. He's like, I want an iPhone. I'm like, well, you're going to have to work because they are expensive. It's an expensive paperweight if you're not connected to the power source. I got, I got all these interesting stats on charging phones. 69% of Americans charge their phone twice a day. How many of y'all do that? Twice a day, anybody? How many of you are more than twice a day? 
How many of you carry around the brick on your, like in your pocket? So you can, <laughs> you might got a charging brick. Okay. 64% of Americans charge their phones overnight. Anybody else? I fall in that category overnight. I wake up and phone is charged. Okay. 64% leave their phone plugged in to charge for at least 40 minutes. How many of you are like, I can't even be away from my phone for 40 minutes. I can't do that. Better have that brick on me, okay? I'm not gonna make it, all right? Charging our phones is a big deal because we don't wanna lose power because at the end of the day, if you lose power, you lose everything in life, don't you? Like, if think about it. You can't do anything without this phone, can you? We've had conversations recently where I'm like, I think I might go with a flip phone just to like rid myself of the need for the, the smartphone because everything that I do in life is on this phone, isn't it? Everything. We were in Houston, Texas earlier in the month. If, if you were here, I got to preach back home at Hope City, the church that we were planted out of and launched out of. And while we were there, a hurricane came through, Hurricane Barrel. And we were there for it, and we had been watching the weather, like, when are we gonna head home? Because it's a long drive. We drove that thing. God was with us for 16 hours. It was crazy. And uh, so we were watching the storm, and we were like, all right, we're gonna wait an extra day before we hit the road back so that we wouldn't get in the storm following the, the weather forecast and everything. We're at my parents' house. My brother, my sister, uh, brother-in-law, uh, nephew, everybody in, ends up coming over because when the hurricane came through, the power went out. We woke up with no power. Now, how many of y'all have ever been in the Texas heat? Anybody? That's another level. That's another level. And, and I'm telling you, we woke up, the power was off. I'm like, who turned off the AC? Because my mom, I'm telling you, I love you, mom. She's watching online. Hey, y'all give it up for our online audience while we're at it back there. <laughs> my mom will turn the heat on in the summertime, and I'm not kidding you. And I'm like, mom, I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus right now. We ain't playing all that. But I woke up thinking, mom, mom turned the heat on. We ain't doing all that today. It is July. The power was out. We woke up with no power. So all morning, we're trying to figure out. Now, if you've ever had this happen, you ever have the power go out. So if you're at home, your power goes out and your Wi-Fi goes out and then your phone doesn't work. Have y'all ever experienced this? Your phone doesn't work. Like it could say, I got like right now, I got five full bars LTE and it will show you that. But if you're close to your Wi-Fi and the power's out, your phone doesn't work. I mean, and we're walking outside. We're doing like one of these like old school. You remember when you used to have the phone and you pulled up the antenna? You're like this right here. You're like, you know what I'm saying? You're just trying to get some power, trying to get anything. So we finally realized, okay, it's not going to work. I actually, about 90 minutes in, I was like, I'm just going to go drive and see if I can pick up some service somewhere. I go down the road to the grocery store and sure enough, I walk in. I'm like, they got power and the Wi-Fi was, I'm just walking around in the store on the Wi-Fi like this. Like I, now I can check all my apps. I'm like, she's texting me. I'm like, I'll be home soon. I'm just checking the Wi-Fi right now. I'm just in there trying to get some connection because I want to be able to get to the power. Without the power, you have nothing. It is useless at that point. Now, the crazy part about all this, the funny part, we learned a lot about our kids. Now, uh, when we were growing up, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have iPhones, iPads, devices. Come on, how many, how many of y'all grew up in my era? Like, y'all remember Nextel? Y'all remember a Motorola Razor? Anybody? Remember Snake on the phone? Like, this is how we grow up. I used to be in the back seat of the van with my parents, and we'd be traveling, and I got my Discman. Come on, somebody. Rocking that Discman. I was banging out some Kirk Franklin or something in my Discman headphones, making it happen. That's what I grew up with. Now, our kids today, they don't know any of that. So I'll say stuff like that, and they'll be like, you, di you didn't have an iPhone? I'm like, no, they didn't exist. Matter of fact, I bought Megan the very first iPod that came out. Y'all remember? You used to twirl it and it would click. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I bought her one of those. I thought it was the coolest thing. Matter of fact, today, I, I think about it every now and then. I'll be like, I wish we would have kept it because it'd probably be worth a lot of money. I don't ever see one of those anymore. But we had, like, we didn't have all that stuff. And so the kids, when the power went out, and we're in Houston, they were freaking out. I mean, they're coming up, they're like, Daddy, something's wrong with the Wi-Fi. Why is it not working? And I'm like, guys, the power's out. Well, how do we turn the Wi-Fi on? I'm like, without the power, you can't get no Wi-Fi. What am I supposed to do? I'm like, I don't know. Go walk, go eat something. I'm like, go look out the window, go figure it out. You'll find something to do. You're a kid. Go put, I'm telling you, 10 minutes later, daddy, daddy, we got to figure out something. I'm like, buddy, I can't do nothing. He's like, call somebody. I'm like, I can't call nobody. The power, there's no, nobody can help. There's no one that we can get help from. You can go in your room and pray if you'd like. Maybe God will hear you. Maybe he'll answer. I don't know. But they kept asking, how much longer is it going to be? I'm like, guys, I really don't. Finally, I'm like, if y'all don't quit asking me, I'm going to make sure you never get power again. That's how I was feeling. It's funny. They end up going to a point after a while. We're all sitting around the table. We got windows open. We're trying to do anything we can to just get some flow of air. And we're playing board games. And I'm just in this moment of like, this is awesome. Nobody can find me. 
Nobody can connect with me. Nobody knows where I'm at. This is amazing. And we were just enjoying ourselves. Well, at one point, my oldest comes around the corner. He's got my iPad. He comes around the corner. He's like, Daddy, I know what you need to do. I'm like, what do you mean you know what I need to do? He had found a way to connect to a hotspot from somebody's phone. Okay, so he comes around the corner and he's on Google and he shows me, he's like, you need to call them. They can take care. And he's got it pulled off. It said in his search, it said what to do to get the power to come back on in Houston, Texas. I was like, no, you didn't, bro. I said, I'm telling you. He kept saying, I'm telling you. Google says it. I'm like, I'm telling you. I've been around long enough to know Google can't help us here. They don't have the answer to what's happening in Houston, Texas right now. None of us know. They did this multiple times and kept coming back to me. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly and said, Kevin, what would your life look like if you searched for my power the way your kids are searching for power for their iPads? Too many of us are walking around with Dead spirits, because we're not connected to the power source. We want power moves in our lives. Here's the title of my message today. How to be a powerful Christian. Very simple. I was going to try to give you some catchy title, and I thought, you know what? At the end of the day, I want to be a powerful Christian. Anybody else? Come on. How many of you would love to pray with power? How many of you would love to praise with power? How many of you would love when you come in contact with another person and through relationships to experience power? How many of you would love when you prayed for the miracle you're believing for, that power entered the picture and delivered your miracle? How many of y'all want power in your life? Because I want more of God's power. We need some power moves to happen. I was digging into all these stats on uh, charging phones and prayer. Check these stats out. This is why I'm passionate about this today. 82% of people surveyed out of 14,000, 82% of people pray silently by themselves. 82 of 100, silently by themselves. 13% pray audibly by themselves. Now I hear you. I know which ones of y'all that is because I hear you in worship. I hear you praying. I love it. Check this one out. Only 2% pray audibly with another person or group. Only 2%. Only 2% collectively pray with a church. If we're going to be anything as a church, we better be a praying church. If we are not a praying church, we are not a powerful church because a praying church is a powerful church. And if we have no prayer, we have nothing to offer you. I make sure when I step up here to bring the word to you each Sunday that it is coming from a place of overflow and there has been power in my personal life before I ever try to come into the assembly and teach you how to find the power. Come on, I've got the power. Come on, I want power in my life. All of us want more power in our life. Out of those 14,000 people, 2% say they were very satisfied with their prayer life. 2%. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to raise hands or do a show of hands. But what I am going to ask you to is internalize, where do I fall within these statistics? They came up on their own with the fact they believe 15% of churchgoers have a rich prayer life. Now, our vision here at Trove Heights is very simple. We want to help you dream big, search deep, find more, and live rich. And I'm telling you, if you want to live rich, you better be in the 15% of people that have a rich prayer life. Without it, you will never live rich. You just won't. What is living rich? It doesn't mean having everything that I want. It doesn't mean like name it and claim it. You know what? I want a private jet. Come on. I'm, it doesn't mean any of that. What it means is in this world, you'll have trouble, but take heart. I got the power in the middle of my trouble. That's what it means. I got Jesus in the middle of all that. What keeps us from prayer? 57% of people say distraction. There's just too much going on. I'm just distracted all the time. I wake up, I'm distracted. I got to do this. I gotta, 15% say it's because of busyness. I don't pray because I'm, I'm just too busy too busy for prayer. I'm just going to tell you, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy for God. Because that is our lifeline with God. That's how we stay connected to the power source is through prayer. 15%, this one's where you get in dangerous territory. 15% are just indifferent. There's indifference. I just, I don't care. I don't want to pray and I don't really care. I just don't want to do it. And then 13% say they're lost for words. I think 13% would pray if they knew how to pray. And today my goal is to equip you with why we pray, but then how to do it so that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you can dive into a 6 a.m. prayer service and you can pray like you've never prayed. You ever been in a prayer circle? Come on, y'all remember old school? We came up in Sunday school and they'd be like, everybody grab hand with it. And you're like, you get somebody's hand that's like they're squeezing tight. You're like, Lord, yeah, or they're sweaty or like cold or so. Y'all remember these days? Come on, everybody right now grab. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do it in here. I came up and it's like, don't make us do the hand thing. You know what I mean? Like, but you ever get around somebody in one of those moments and you're like, they can really pray. Like they grab your hand, they start praying. You feel it go up your arms. You're like, ooh, mm. you start feeling the, you start feeling, you feel the power. 
I want to be one of those people that when I pray for you, you go, man, something just, something just happened. What was that? I had a friend years ago. I was about, I don't know, 12, 18 months into my walk with Jesus. And I was as far away from God as I could be before I recommitted my life to him. And I had a friend that called me out of the blue one day. And he says, man, I, I really need some help. Um, I'm going through some things and I figured you could probably help me. So I told Megan in this moment, his name was Kyle. I said, I'm going to go over there and see what he needs. So I drive over there. We spent probably an hour just listening to rap music because that's what, that's what your boy listens to, worship and rap. That's what I do, all right? And it ain't like, it ain't like crazy rap. It's, it's Jesus rap, just so y'all know, okay? What is pastor listening to? <laughs> and I remember going in there, and finally after so long, I just said, bro, what's up? Why'd you want me to come over here? And he starts telling me everything that he's going through. So I'm like, man, let's go out to the car. I got a song I want you to hear because I used to make rap music because your boy's a rapper, okay? I think there's power in the godly rap. Come on, somebody. Yes. I go sit in the car, let him hear this song that pertained to his situation. And then after, I said, man, I hope that encouraged you a little bit. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, I just know I got to make some changes. I've watched what you've done. I don't know how to do it, but I need some help. And I said, well, if you're cool with it, I'll just put a hand on your shoulder and I'll pray for you because scripture says when the laying on of hands happens... The prayer of a righteous man and a righteous person availeth much is what scripture says, accomplishes much. So we are a church that believes in laying on of hands because something happens when two or more are gathered. So anyway, I said, if you're cool with it, he said, yeah, I just put a hand on him. Lord God, right now, I just pray that you bless my brother Kyle. Whatever he's going through, I just prayed a prayer. I didn't get loud. I didn't cra get crazy. And I just said, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. I gave him the preacher voice, Amen. And I literally looked up and he went, phew, phew. he said, I ain't had nobody do that for me in a long time. I, I just felt something right there. I said, bro, that's the power and presence of God. And I'm just telling you, you can have it in your own life if you want it. Yeah. How many of you would love to be able to, when somebody's going through something, when you're the person in their life that they call, you can walk up and be like, let me put a hand on your shoulder and let me pray for you and watch them go, phew, something just happened when you prayed for me. That's what I want us to be as a church because we have to be a praying church. Too many times we do what this quote says. It says, when we re relegate prayer to the world of feelings, meaning when we want to or when we don't, prayer becomes mere therapy. Prayer is not therapy, everybody. We don't go to prayer because I just need to relieve some stress. I go to prayer to get with God. I go to prayer to talk to God, to listen to his voice and find out, God, what do you have for me today that you want me to do? How can I move in faith? The great revivalist D.L. Moody said, he who kneels the most stands the best. Come on, if you want to be anything as a Christian, if you want to be a powerful Christian, you got to be a praying Christian. How many of you would love to fall in love with prayer so that you can have more power in your life? Anybody? I think we should fall in love with prayer and watch what God can do out of it. We need to make some power moves. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, if a church is to be what it ought to be for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. That's my goal out of this message for the next few minutes and out of this series is I want to teach you the art of prayer. There's a little bit of an art to it, if you will, but you got to learn how to do it. How, what do I say? When do I say it? How long is too long? How short is too short? What words should I refrain from? Like you can have all these questions and you start overthinking. So then you just don't pray. And that's the devil's goal for you. Yeah. The devil's goal for you is to not pray. You know why? Because the devil is not concerned with a prayerless Christian. You mean him no harm if you're not praying. You can be like, Jesus lives in my heart. I'm a Christian. But if you ain't doing nothing about it, he is not worried about you. Yeah. I think we should be a church that when the devil sees us on Sunday, he goes running because he's like, that's a people full of the power and presence of God. That's what we're going to be as a church, everybody. <laughs> Leviticus chapter six is the text I'm going to, I'm going to give you here on the front end and I'm going to blow through that. I got way too much content. I've been digging into prayer stuff all way. I'm just fired up for this word. I'm going I'm to give you as much as I can and then we'll see what God does after the fact. Because if you're new around here, we are a Holy Spirit filled, Holy Spirit led church. This morning, I was praying in the spirit for you. I was praying for you, and I just, God, have your way. If God wants to cut the service short and do it a different way, we're going to let him today in Jesus' name. How many of y'all want a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on you? I need it. I need it. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12. By the way, uh, Leviticus is probably my least favorite book in the Bible. If you don't know about Leviticus, go read it. You'll see why. If I'm preaching from it, that tells you it's about to be good, just so you know. Leviticus chapter 6, verse 12. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. 
Every morning the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire, once again he says that the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Your body is now the temple. In the Old Testament, there was a priest who would go into the Holy of Holies and they would have to go through this whole process with all these different offerings, the atonement offering to atone for their sins. They'd have a thanks offering. They'd, they'd have to slaughter these animals, put them on the altar and burn them. And God, only, only the priest could go into that place and make sure that the fire was continuously burning on the altar. Today, the way that applies to us is that when Jesus died on the cross in the New Testament, Jesus... We we did communion earlier talking about this. When Jesus died on the cross and then he rose from the grave, when he died on the cross, the veil was torn and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit showed up into the picture after Jesus left. And so now our lives are the temple. Our bodies are the temple, which means you need to always have a fire burning on the altar of your temple at all times. The fire, he said, the fire must never go out. Which means what we do too many times is we go, well, the fire is dying, so let's throw some more wood on the fire. But if you wake up every morning intent on nurturing the fire, then the fire will never get small. Because I don't want a fire that's about to go out. I want a fire that never is small. Yeah, I grew up in this culture of church where it was like, you know, you'd see somebody, they'd run down the front. They just went praising. Ah, you'd be like, they're on fire. I don't know who said that was an on fire thing. I don't know. I mean, I, I saw some, I had some cool experiences in the presence of God growing up in the culture that I was in. But fire is something that you don't have to see outwardly. You can feel it from somebody. Like if you come talk with me, you will feel the fire in my life because I'm gonna encourage you. I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna offer you scripture that gives you strength. I'm a, I gotta keep my fire continuously burning because if you forget your fire, it's because you're forgetting God. If you're not spending time with Jesus, your fire will go out. Now, I think there's some Christians, some of us in the room today that came in here and our fire has died out. There's just some ashes left. But you love God, God loves you, but maybe you just haven't been worried about building the fire. The best thing that I can teach you how to do, the best thing I can do for you is not preach a message. Because honestly, I said this last week, none of y'all remember what I say anyway. I don't remember what I say. (laughs) But I remember what God did in the room. My goal is to give you some stuff that you can teach. This is why taking notes is so important because when you take notes, you can go home and be reminded of what God's word says and you go study yourself approved out of the word of God because you gotta make sure that your fire is never gonna go out. Martin Luther said this. He said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Prayer is the breath of a Christian. How to be a powerful Christian? Prayer. That's how you do it. I'm gonna give you a few quick things. Number one, you gotta have the priority of prayer in your life. You gotta have the priority of prayer because much prayer equals much power. Without pr- little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. Power is the, prayer is the number one thing that I can teach you. You gotta have it. It's the most important thing that you can do as a believer is develop a prayer life. Honestly, the most important thing. Here's why. I gave my life to Jesus and I know I need to read the Bible, but I didn't like it. I was very honest with God in prayer. Like, God, I don't like it. It's boring. I don't understand it. I don't wanna read it. I'm being real with y'all. I went to God with that in prayer. God ain't mad at you when you come to him and download it with him. Just go, don't go downloading it with other people sometimes. Go talk to God about it. And I'm telling you, I I ask God through prayer, God, I want to fall in love with your word. Will you help me do that? Guess what he did? He made me fall in love with this book. It has changed my life. It has transformed me. It came through the power of prayer because prayer is a few things I wrote down. Prayer is a sin killer. Prayer is a power bringer. Prayer is a Christ revealer. It's an obstacle remover. It's a dispute healer. It's a holiness promoter. It is a victory giver. My prayer time is like my time in the phone booth, like Superman. And when I walk out of that thing, ha, I'm ready to go. Today's going to be a good day because I've got the power. You need some power in your life. D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. You get on your knees in prayer. I heard a a pastor say once, he said, a man on his face can never fall from that position. 
You want to overcome your sin and your temptation? You better get on your knees in prayer and seek God because it is what is going to give you the power in your life. You have to have a priority of prayer. Number two, you have to have a prayer time. I'm going to get very practical and I'm going to go as quick as I can because we're going to have a prayer time in just a couple of minutes. You have to have a prayer time. Now, I, you have to figure out your time, but I would highly encourage you to make your prayer time the start of your morning. Here at Trove Heights, we call it the first 15. This is the first 15 minutes of your day, five minutes in the Word, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer. If I, I'm just telling you, I take, I'm gonna give you a guarantee. Y'all like guarantee? Don't you like a money back guarantee? Don't you like a guarantee? I'm gonna give you a guarantee. If you take these next 21 days of prayer and fasting, and every morning, no matter what happens, for 21 days, you do your first 15. Five minutes in the Word, five minutes in worship, and five minutes in prayer. I promise you, you will be full of power in 21 days. I, I guarantee you. It's a guarantee. Just do it. 21 days of prayer, the first 15, and get after it. Now listen, your prayers don't have to be perfect, but they do have to be. You just got to be praying. What does prayer look like? God, just today, I don't even know what to say. I just want to thank you. That's why I love that song. I just want to thank you today. Just thank God for what he's done in your life. You gotta have a prayer time. A prayer time is so important because in the Bible, there were two times of prayer. There was 9 a.m. and there was 3 p.m., which was the evening time of prayer. They had a morning time of prayer and an evening time of prayer. If you do morning and evening, I'm gonna say you're gonna be full of power. Morning and evening. Elijah called down fire from heaven at 3 p.m. In Daniel chapter nine, verse 21, when he was praying and fasting for 21 days, it says the angel Gabriel showed up at 3 p.m. Something about that prayer time, the day of Pentecost, when the 120 were gathered in the upper room, the Holy Spirit fell and descended on them at what time? 9 a.m., the time of prayer. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John healed the lame man at the prayer time, 9 a.m., headed to the temple. And when you wake up like, I'm gonna go get in prayer, the power shows up. 9 a.m., 3 p.m., Jesus died at 3 p.m., and the veil was torn, and the Holy Spirit showed up and changed everything. You got to have a prayer time. I know I'm fired up, y'all, but I'm, tell I'm full of power right now. I'm full of power. I've been praying, and I want you to experience what I've experienced in my life over the last 11 years because it will change everything. You got to have a prayer time. Daniel chapter six, verse 10. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published not to pray towards his God, it says, instead, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open for everybody to see. And three times a day, he had a prayer time and got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. I don't care what kind of laws and decrees our world passes. My prayer time is never going to stop. I'm going to get after it in my prayer time because in the prayer time is when things change. And when prayer becomes your habit, miracles will become your lifestyle. You got to have a time of prayer, a dedicate. You need to schedule your time of prayer. If you're like, I got to leave work. I got to leave for work by 6 a.m. So if I get up at 530, I'll be ready by 559. I'm going to tell you right now, get up at 515. Get in your first 15. Just schedule it. You'll Check this out. You will never regret a prayer time. I regret a lot of things in my life, but I've never had a prayer time that I exited and went, ha, I regret that. Never happening. You gotta have a prayer time. Number, the next thing, you gotta have a prayer place. You gotta have a prayer place. Jesus constantly went away to a solitary place to pray. He would be preaching to 5,000, 10,000 people on the hillside. And the first thing he would do, the disciples would go talk to him. He'd be like, hold up. I got to go to the top of the mountain. And he would go to a solitary place to pray. If Jesus needed to pray, I think we probably need to be praying. Jesus was God in the flesh and he still went to pray to the Father. And sometimes it'd be hours on end, but he went away to pray. In Genesis chapter 24, we had a guy named Isaac that we see who went out into, in the field to pray because he was looking for a young wife. He was looking for, how many single people in the house? Come on, single people. Come on, keep your hand high. Y'all look around, single people. <laughs> See what you're working with. Look around. Okay. Genesis 24, 63. It says, Isaac went out to the field one evening to meditate. And as he looked up, he saw camels approaching and there she was. He sees Rebecca. He's like, oh Lord, prayer time done worked. Come on. So I think what would happen if you went into your prayer time? Like Lord Jesus, right now I'm calling my future husband into existence. I'm calling my future wife into my life in Jesus name. Yeah, you'll get these miracles out of a prayer time in a prayer place. And it doesn't matter if you go into the field or on top of a mountain or into your bathroom to escape from your kids. You just need to have a place where you go, God, right now, I don't care what's happening. I'm going to give you my attention. 
Is this helping anybody today? I'm t- I just want you to get fired up about prayer. I have my practice and Megan knows. Now, normally I wake up and I will try not to wake anybody up. I throw in my AirPods. I'm gonna just teach you what I do real quick. Is that cool? I'm gonna teach you what I do. I put in my AirPods and I get my, I, I get my iPad. I have my Bible app on my iPad. You need the Bible app. Okay, get you the Bible app. And I go make me uh, two pods of coffee in one big cup. That's just what I do. You do you, all right? That's what I do. And I turn, and I turn on, I, I drink a lot of caffeine, just so y'all know. Uh, this morning I had a ghost and a venti vanilla sweet cream cold brew. And the Holy Spirit. Y'all better get ready, I'm telling you. I, I get my cup of coffee, I got my AirPods, I turn on my iPad, I turn on instrumental piano worship. This is just what I do. Uh, now, sometimes I'll do songs, but I like to turn on my instrumental piano worship because as I have my AirPods in, I have to be quiet because I just like going, I love you, Lord. You're so good on my Monday morning. Thank you for what you did yesterday. I don't sing in these same notes the whole time, just so y'all know, but this is kind of what I do. And I just start worshiping God. <laughs> I just start worshiping God and then I go find my place. Now, sometimes my place is usually in one of my two kids' rooms. They both have a a recliner because where there's a recliner, the glory of the Lord shows up just so y'all know. So I have the recliner and if I go into his room and he's still asleep, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go upstairs. He's got a rocking chair. That'll do too. So I'll go to the right and then he's still, I'm like, Lord, where am I gonna go? I gotta go somewhere. And then I go outside on the front porch and sometimes I'll just be out there on the front porch. Just thank you, Jesus. I know the neighbors are like, who is this guy over here? What is he doing? Rocking back and forth, just thanking God. It ain't even a rocking chair. I, I, I just got, I'm fired up, y'all. And yes, I'm the real pastor if it's your first time here. I know, I know. Got to have a prayer time and a prayer place. But I get in my space, and I've told Megan, I need an hour. Yeah. Now, nobody told me I had to have an hour. I just got to where I want an hour. Yeah. When, I wake, when I wake up in the morning and I feel his presence, I just don't want to leave. I don't want to leave my prayer place. And then over time, my first 15 turned into 20 and 25 and 30 and 35. And before I knew it, I started looking at the clock going, what time is it? How long have I been in here? And the presence of God will do that to you if you let him. You just got to have a prayer time and a prayer place. And then you need a prayer pattern. Matthew chapter six, verse nine through 13. If you're at Luke 11, you can stay right there. Same scripture passage. I'm going to read this to you real quick. This is what's called the Lord's Prayer. It says, in this manner, therefore pray. What happened in Luke 11, the disciples come to Jesus. They see him performing miracles, preaching to hillsides of thousands of people. And they come to him and they say, master, teach us to pray. So I'm going to give you what Jesus said on how to pray. They said, Jesus, teach us to pray. And this is what he said. He said, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father, come on, if you know it, say it with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Come on, give God praise for that right there. The Lord's Prayer. I grew up on the Lord's Prayer and I could recite it to you, but it had no power in it because it was words that I learned, but I didn't mean it. I didn't understand that this is how Jesus said, okay, you want me to teach you to pray? This is how. Now, this is really what the disciples were saying to Jesus. They weren't saying, master, teach us to pray. They were saying, teach us how to have the power that you have. And his response was, if you want to know the power I have, you got to pray like this. Now, part of what he says right there is he says, when you pray, I want you to say. I'm going to go back to that in just a moment, but then he gives them six categories real quick. I got to get moving. He gives them six categories. This is the Lord's Prayer broken down for you. Six categories. I would take a picture of this as it comes up on the screen. Praise, go to the next one. Just roll through them all, Jonathan. Praise, priority, provision, pardon, power, praise. This is your six-step prayer outline. Take a picture of that and leave it up for just a second. This is going to help you, okay? This is what happens. First, we praise our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. I will not go into prayer asking God for some stuff without exalting his holy name. This is what I do every God today. I exalt your holy name. Oh, you are so worthy of all my praise. I give him all the praise he's due. Then I turn my prayer time into his priority, not mine. My, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my kingdom come and my will be done. God, today I got some stuff, but I 
I want your will to be done in my life. I'm gonna go into priority. Then I'm gonna move into provision and I'll start asking him for all the requests that I need help with. God, I don't know how to raise my kids. God, I don't know how to lead this church. God, I need your help. So I'm gonna need you to show up. I'm praying for financial blessings. I'm praying for healing in my body. I'm praying for my son or my daughter that's wayward and far. I just start going through my provision list. Then this is the part a lot of people skip over. You need to forgive some folks. It actually says in scripture that he will not forgive you unless you forgive other people. But we like to skip right. I like the provision part. I like the power part. That pardon thing. I don't, you don't know what, you don't know what Jessica said to me, God. I do. I was there. Matter of fact, that's what he said. I was there. I was there. And forgiveness is in spite of how you feel. It's not because I feel like it today. I'm, I, it'll take me about a week. God is saying, no, today, this is how I'm telling you to pray because this is where power comes from. Then I'm going to go into the power moment and I'm going to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Here's the problem with too many of us. You keep getting beat up by temptation. It's because you're not praying. If you pray every day, God, today, start my day saying, God, lead me not into temptation. I don't want none of that. I want all of you. I'm fasting. It's really hard to give in to temptation when you just prayed against the temptation. I'm just telling you. You need to pray against it. It'll give you power. And then we're going to wrap it all up in praise again. The ending time for me with my instrumental music is, God, today you're so worthy. I exalt thee. And I just start singing unto the Lord all he's due. Because he has many, many names, everybody. He is Jehovah Rapha, my healer. He is Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. And if you don't know nothing about none of those words, all you need to know is the name of Jesus at that name, every knee will bow. The name that is above every name. And I'm just going to thank you, Jesus. Start playing for me. Start playing so I'll stop. Start playing. Oh, God. You need to have power in your right in your life. The Jews at the Welling Wall in Jerusalem, they go every day at the time of prayer and pray. Every day, never fail, seven days a week. There's no secret as to why they have the lowest crime rate in the world, the lowest drug rate in the world, the lowest divorce rate in the world comes from the Jews who show up at this Welling Wall because they go pray every day. If you're married, pray together. Stats show us that one out of 2,000 marriages that pray together end in divorce. One out of 2,000. But stats also show us that 50% of all marriages in the earth end in divorce. Half. What would happen if we begin to pray together? We've had many moments where we just pray together. And they're honestly the most powerful moments I've ever had is when I pray with my wife. Something happens when you do that. A marriage that prays together will stay together. Come on, somebody. You just need to be praying. It doesn't matter how you do it. You just need to start praying. You need to pray the Lord's Prayer. You need to pray for people. You got this guy who pastors the largest church in America, Dr. Henry Cho. He said, every day I pray for so many people because I hate so many people. <laughs> if that's why you're praying for people, it doesn't matter. You need to go before the Lord. Say, God, this, this Jessica lady is killing me, Lord God. I need your help. Send them. And I don't mean like pray like send a thousand flies on her in Jesus. I mean like really pray for her. All right. Then you need a prayer posture. You need, to, you need to pray out loud. When you pray, say is what he said in Luke 11 too. When you pray, everybody say the word, say. You need to say. When you pray, what is it? Say. When you pray, say. It doesn't say when you pray, think a little happy thought in your heart. Meditate. Hear the, hear the birds. Smell the flower. No, it doesn't say that. When you pray, say. Because some... This will help somebody. Sometimes your faith needs to hear what you have to say. Sometimes as you, have you ever prayed something and as you pray it, you go, what did I just say? I've had some moments like that where I'm like, I say something, I'm like, God, I don't even believe what I just said. Help me with my unbelief. Your mouth should be speaking stuff that makes your faith go, oh, I like the way that sounded. I like the way that felt. I think God might can do some of that in my life. When you pray, you gotta say how can we do all this and do it well? Because at the end of the day, I want the power of God in my life. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 16. It says, first off, rejoice always. And that means even when it's bad. Rejoice always and then pray continually at all times. I will bless the name of the Lord at all times. I, I have this posture. I know I'm not like a, a crazy, you know, long intercessor prayer warrior. Like I, I don't wake up at 4.30 in the morning and pray. God's not up then. So I don't get up then. Okay. Now, now I, I know some of us who are like, you get up every morning. Like the Lord called me to get up at 3 a.m. I'm like, I didn't get that call today. I don't know. 
But some people do. If you're an intercessor prayer where you, you love to play, pray for hours on the end, we need you to pray for this house. I need you to pray for me. I covet your prayers. Can I say it that way? I need your prayers. I'm more in the vein of, I never pray for more than 20 minutes, but I never go 20 minutes without praying. I'm just walking and talking with the Lord. I'm walking the dogs. I'm like, Lord Jesus, today, I don't know how I'm gonna get through this Monday. But one thing I know is that if I'm walking with you today, you're gonna have it all taken care of. I trust your provision. I trust you. I just walk and talk with you. Just walk and talk with the Lord. You need to get some warfare prayer going on. We need to go back to the fire of the altar and never let it go out. Let it be burning continuously because when the fire never stops burning, the power will never leave your life. You need more power, you need to pray more. And it doesn't matter how you pray. It just matters that you pray. Sometimes I go to God in prayer and I will just cry out to him, God, I don't even know what to pray today. But scripture says we have a God so good that the spirit is groaning with utterances on our behalf in prayer. We have a God who is right there with us all along. He doesn't care what you have to say to him. He just cares that you say it to him. Just go download it with him. Take it to him. There's no time that you're going to get in a day sweeter than that time in the presence of God. I'm just telling you, it is the number one thing you can do. I'm going to give you an acronym for pray, and then I'm going to have some, some people come up front and pray. I went longer than I wanted to, and I got so much more. Maybe we'll make a part two. I don't know. I got a lot more left in here, okay? Pray. Here's you an acronym. You can praise, then you can repent, and then you can ask, and then you can yield. Pray, repent, ask, yield. God, today, I just need you. I need you more than I've ever needed you. Today, I repent of my wicked ways. I confess, God, all of my downfalls and my shortcomings, but I trust that you're gonna do it. And God, today, I thank you for cleansing me of all my unrighteousness. Then you begin to ask him, God, today, I need a financial breakthrough in my life. God, today, I, my body hurts. God, I got a pain going. I don't know what to do with God, my job. I don't know what's up. It's up in the air. I don't know what to do. So, but God, at the end of the day, today, I yield to your will and your way. God, have your way in my life. You just begin to pray. And watch what God will do. I was as far away from God as I could be for 10 long years. And I had people praying for me all over the place. Throw up this picture, Jonathan. I had people praying for me all over the place for a long time. I, now, I was as far away from God as I could be. And my mom sent me this note one day after I had given my life back to Jesus. I think we have this picture. There we go. For 10 years, one of my mom's friends had this on her prayer list. Lucas, for Kevin Jr. to find God's direction in his life. <laughs> I am a product today of prayer. This church is a product of prayer. If it wasn't for my mom gathering some people to say, pray for my son, he needs Jesus, this church would not exist because I don't know where I'd even be. But God showed up in the middle of prayer time at a prayer place, in a prayer posture, in a say out loud, I'm gonna just trust God for all that he wants to do in my life. And because of it, look what the Lord has done. 170 people gave their lives to Jesus because someone prayed for someone who needed Jesus. And if you begin to pray and open up your mouth and ask God for more, he'll give you power. You'll see him do things you've never seen him do. You'll experience his presence like you never have. And here today to close this service, that's what we're going to do together. Come on, prayer team, y'all just, just line up here somewhere. If you're a leader in this house, if you're like, I got the gift of prayer, come on up here. We're going to pray for you. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to close a little different for just a few minutes. I want to create a time of prayer for you. If you need a prayer for a healing in your body, come on, just step up right here, right now. Everybody, a matter of fact, everybody just stand on your feet with me. Just stand on your feet right there where you're at because I don't want anybody feeling uncomfortable. If you need prayer for a, a, an issue in your body, I know I've got a shoulder pain going on in my life right now. So actually, I'm gonna have AJ pray for me while somebody else gets prayer. Come on, if you need prayer for anything in your body, healing, we believe that God heals everybody. Signs, wonders, and miracles. I have a pain in my shoulder I've been dealing with forever. I've been praying for it, but I'm gonna have somebody believe in uh, agreement with me today. Come on, if you need prayer for healing, if you need a fight, financial miracle in your life. Come down front and get prayed. I need a financial miracle in my life. Come on, if you know somebody far from God that you're believing for, that God's going to change their life like me, I pray that you just come up front and get prayed for. Come on, Holy Spirit, y'all begin to play. Holy Spirit, I thank you, Jesus, for what you're going to do in this room today. Oh, God, have your way. Holy Spirit, I pray for healing. I pray for miracles right now in the name of Jesus. God, you begin to fill this place. Open up the floodgates. Mighty God, I need you today, Jesus. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you for your sweet, sweet presence, your grace, your mercy, your goodness. Come on, if you're a prayer warrior, begin to lift your voice in this room. God, today we need you, Jesus. We're hungry for you. We're asking you for greater healing in this place, God. Let bodies be healed. God, let wounds be restored. Let brokenness be turned into healing and wholeness today. In Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, have your way. Oh, God.